Hi there, I'm Stephen from Artifact, and today on Meet YC, I'm talking with Oriana Papin Zogby about her journey as a founder. Oriana is a co founder of AOA, a startup doing some really interesting and important work in cancer detection. So, Oriana, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, could you please just briefly introduce yourself and uh, your company for our listeners? Sure. My name is Oriana Papin Zogby. I am in the New York area at the moment. Um, I am the co founder and CEO of AOA DX, and we are focused on the early detection of cancer, starting off with a blood based test for the early detection of ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, today, 80% of women that are diagnosed with ovarian cancer are diagnosed when they are already at stage three and four. And at that point, the survival rate is only 28%. And the reason being, there is no diagnostic test available today. It takes over Mm -hmm. nine months to reach a diagnosis. And so what we are working on is a blood test to give physicians and providers a tool so that when a woman first starts experiencing symptoms, she can quickly and accurately be diagnosed and catch the disease much earlier. Ovarian cancer, when diagnosed at stage one and two, actually has a 90% survival rate. Okay, wow. That, that's an enormous difference then that you guys are, are trying to make. Yes. Can you tell me how, how you like got into the space? Like, uh, what, what is a little bit about your background uh, and how did it lead to you, you know, tackling this issue? Yeah, I've been in the diagnostic space, almost always exclusively focused on women's health for over a decade now. Um, I would say I stumbled into this in an internship right at my senior year at Boston University, working for a, a mid-stage women's health diagnostic company, and, and then um, purposely stayed here ever since. Um, uniquely, I would say I've been working with both of my co-founders now during that entire time. So through wow. two previous women's health diagnostic companies, um, going on to successful exits, to the acquirers in between, we've kind of stuck by each other's side. And, you know, I've worked on everything from uh, point of care diagnostics tests in the maternal fetal medicine space in the U.S. and in Europe. I've worked on wide-based screening for HPV, so for cervical cancer and for infectious diseases in Africa and in Eastern Europe. And, you know, all with the same theme of sort of increasing access to care for women for, for diseases that disproportionately affect them. And then in 2018, after the exit of the last business that we were all a part of, the three of us decided to get back together again and say, well, where is there another area in women's health that really needs innovating and and how can we have an impact there? Yeah, I mean, I was sort of going to ask for like the background of like your co-founders and how you came together as well. But um, it seems like really you've all been thinking along the same lines and and working together towards the same goals for uh, quite a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would say we're very, very much in sync with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, well, I mean, that in itself uh, can often be a challenge. Uh, it sounds like it, it might not have been too much in this case. But what were some of the challenges? So when we first started, we set out to find an innovation in, in women's health. And that was honestly our first challenge because none of us are scientists. None of us are inventors, <laughs> engineers. So it, we were not in a position where we, we said, we're going to go get some grant funding and sit in a lab and develop something. We went to hunt IP. We went to academic institutions to check transfer offices, to patents, to publications and said, where is there research that isn't being developed? Could we develop a company out of it? And we diligenced so many different things from preeclampsia to care in C-section to endometriosis to just different areas that we were passionate about. In some, I would say some of the biggest challenges, we would get so far along and like think, okay, this is it, this is it, this is it, and then discover something and realize, okay, this is not it. And that process <laughs> happened so many times until we finally met with Professor Saragovi and we went through the whole diligence process and we said, okay, this is it, this is it, this is it. And then at the very end, we're like, nope, this is definitely it. Um, and then started to build the company around that. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about your company? Uh, I mean, first of all, just like, I guess, how, how big is your team? And also, um, how, how do you function as a team? And um, what, uh, what are some of the traits that you think makes your team successful? Yeah. Um, so there's the three co-founders, myself, Anna, and Alex, who have been working together now. We recently hired our VP of R&D and uh, the inventor of the technology, Professor Saragovi. He stays with us as our part-time uh, chief scientific officer. Um, mm-hmm. And then from there, we have like a great group of, of consultants and part-time hires. I think the thing that differentiates us and that makes us work really well is not only the fact that we have a history together, but we have a history together doing a very, very similar project. So we've gone through the ups and downs of recruiting for a clinical trial. We've gone through the ups and downs of delays with the FDA of, you know, preparing a company for acquisition. Um, so there's there's so much 
experience amongst us, but I think more importantly, there's experience amongst us having done it together. We're so uniquely different. Our core competencies are very different. Um, mm-hmm. And our the things that we're passionate about and interested at are, are also very different. Um, but we work so well together because of those differences and because we're constantly challenging each other. As cheesy as it is to say, like we finish each other's sentences, we really, really <laughs> do just feed so well off of each other. I, I know that you've also said that uh, diversity is important to your company. Uh, you know, in what ways is it important? What, what benefits do you think that it gives you? Yeah, for us, what we're, we're always looking for is not just more sort of female represented leadership, um, but diverse backgrounds, diverse cultures, ethni- ethnicities. We've seen in the data, you know, how diversity positively impacts companies and, and companies' abilities to make decisions, to mitigate crises. Um, and what we're looking for is to, to be representative of that, not only in the people that we hire, but in the composition of our board, in the composition of our investors. We're really selective, not only sort of who's going to be a value add from their specific role perspective, but really who's going to embody all that AOA believes in, all that the three of us believe in, that's going to be a value add to the company itself. So I have a very mixed cultural background. I have a Hispanic background. My my family's part Hispanic, part Middle Eastern. Anna is an immigrant into the US from Russia. Alex is from the UK. We recently hired Prasad, who is originally and his family is from India. Um, Our investors are a big diverse group. We're really focusing on fi- finding female investors as well, you know, to work on that next generation of wealth. And so that's something that that we are really that we find really important to our cause. What are a few things that you've learned that uh, maybe you wish you could go back and tell yourself at the beginning of this uh, journey with this company or, or you know, um, lessons you've learned that, that you would like to pass on to other people who might be starting uh, starting a similar journey? <laughs> when you this is so clear in my mind. When you're first raising money, <laughs> do not book the first meetings with your top target investors <laughs> because you're <laughs> okay. going to be so like practice first with um, right. with sort of investors that are going to be more friendly to your story or who are going to probably give you good constructive feedback rather than that VC firm that you absolutely want to have into the round. I made that mistake <laughs> my first round um, and they did not invest. I was so raw. It was the first time I was ever raising money and I could tell I got out that call and I was like, that was not my best work. And then like a week in, I was having so many pitches. I was like, okay, now my pitch is really good. I should do that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you get in the so, group. you know, practice, practice, practice and prepare. And then just, I, I went back to that investor and I went back and I keep going back until they finally invest in my round. So also just don't give up, you know, be resilient. Yeah. <laughs> I find it interesting the way that you talk about choosing your investors, because I feel like so often it gets talked about, you know, I mean, you need some investors, right? Like, like, and I think people usually talk about it as, you know, hoping that they choose you. But it sounds like you guys have been really conscientious about uh, deciding who invests and, and who you work with. Is that fair to say? Yeah. But I think that comes down to like, we were oversubscribed in our last round. We're going to be oversubscribed in this round. There's more demand for us than, than equity that we're willing to give up. And and that comes down to build a company that people want to invest in. And then right. you get to be in the driver's seat to choose your investors. So for us, it was like head down, getting the work done, reaching our milestones, getting our clinical studies, signing the contracts, just doing the work to make yourself a company that people want to invest in. So then you give yourself that choice because more often than not, it's the other way around, right? It's like there you are yeah. trying to really get investors. You're trying to convince, you're trying to get investors. And so you you end up taking money from anybody that will invest in you because at the end of the day, you need money to survive. But sort of to to be able to flip the table, you have to build a company and you have to get your milestones accomplished in a way that makes you the one in control. What are you looking forward to over maybe the next year? I mean, um, we talked, you talked about milestones. What are a couple milestones coming up or or just things that you're excited uh, for in the near future with your company? I'm very excited to close this round. Uh, we're raising one right now, so I'm very excited to close that. I'm very excited for the next steps. Um, you know, honestly, we're going to be growing our team. We're going to be moving forward with the next steps in our assay development. We're going to be moving forward with our next clinical trials. So 
honestly, I'm excited to get back to work and not be raising money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think also something that, you know, we haven't touched on that's really, um, I'm really looking forward to next year is we're going to be expanding our research to expand our platform. And so we're, we're very focused on ovarian cancer and that's our first test to market, but we have a much broader application. Um, the ability to really go into other cancers as well. I think one thing that's not necessarily entirely novel in the field, but it's up and coming is this term liquid biopsy. It's being able to do a biopsy on cancer through your blood. And there are some already cancers that we can diagnose through blood, but there are many, many we can't. And this ability to avoid that surgery, especially in cases where it's very hard to get that biopsy, think like brain cancer. And so what we're going after are the next set of cancers where there it would be valuable to actually be able to diagnose it from blood when it's still in the early stage. 